I don't even know what we were talking about before that. We're going to make these arguments on Tuesdays. Um, and the first one we're going to make is about that. So we all got this sheet, right? And we're going to talk about Calder's signature pedagogy for survey level history courses. Hey, Nadia, what's pedagogy? You're an education major. Uh, pedagogy is like how you teach people stuff in a real simple way, right? And so this is like a fancy way to say like these are the six skills I'm going to require you to learn because in a survey level history course, I really don't want you to like memorize all these names and dates of everything that's happened in American history since 1877. Maybe you take a class like that in high school where you felt like you were just memorizing stuff, doing what uh, a, a mentor of mine calls bulimic learning. You just shove it all in, you throw it up on the text, and you lose it forever. That sucks. What do you learn by doing that? Nothing. I want you to learn these six skills and then use them in your day-to-day -day life from here on out. So that's what we're going to do. This is a construct designed to provide a framework for historical thinking. It can be applied to any historical situation or event, or maybe any argument you've been in um, or will be in. And there's six aspects of historical thinking that will kind of be the basis of this entire class. It'll be the basis of all of it. Uh, you can use it on all your assignments. It'll be very useful to you um, in terms of note taking, and it'll be exactly how uh, the uh, midterm and final exam are structured. What you will do is you'll take anything we've talked about in the class, within reason, I'll give you like three or four options, and you pick whichever one you think you can uh, just uh, knock out of the park, and then you'll put it through this framework and go like, here's how this represents progress and decline, continuity and change. You write a paragraph about each, it'll be easy money, <sighs> if you do the things you need to do. All right, so let's talk about this. These aren't gonna be in the order of the slides, but as we talk about this, I want you to be thinking about your assignment for Tuesday. That's why I gave you this sheet. So one of the things you gotta do is make an argument about the greatest of all time, not greatest of the modern era. I mean, you can draw parameters on other arguments. This one, for what we're doing, I want it to be the greatest of all time. Just because it makes for more interesting debates, right? It's not gonna make some Bill Russell points. You'll be like, he's old, and they were converse. See, think about the, that guy. Blocked hundreds of shots in the NBA wearing Converse All-Star sneakers. Ran up and down the floor for 13 years in a row and his knees didn't fall apart. <laughs> LeBron's got huge advantages. That guy's sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber, 24-hour staff. <sighs> anyway, Tuesday. But while we're working through this, one of the things I want you to do is you probably know about something. You could talk about Kurt Vonnegut, the greatest creative writer of all time. No, I'm just kidding. You might have a different opinion. I might have a different opinion. I might take Steinbeck if I had to really put my money on it, but I'm a huge Steinbeck homer. <sighs> you can also talk about actor or actress. You can talk about the greatest rapper of all time or band or other musician, whatever. Does this make sense? Everybody got something in mind? What are we gonna talk about? Everybody got an idea? What are you doing? That it's the greatest of what? Who's the greatest esports person of all time? It's gotta be a person. I want you to focus on a person. Greatest athlete of all time? You gonna pick Serena Williams? Safe bet. I'd be careful. That's a that Serena Williams resume is deep. You seen those pictures of Tom Brady at the combine? Yeah. Guy doesn't look very athletic. <sighs> Yeah, he is great though. Might be maybe maybe safer bet is just go like uh, easy money greatest quarterback of all time debate and just win that one. That's fine. That's another debate we could have. Anybody got other ideas that aren't athletes? I think the athletes framework is pretty easy. What are you gonna do, Nadia? Greatest com comedic actor. Ooh, and you can make a strong Adam Sandler case for that. Spend more money than anybody else. That's a good indicator. We're gonna talk about those things as we get going. Anybody else got other ideas? I'm only asking because then I might, like as I talk through this, then like give you points you can make in your paper. That's gotta be two pages long, double space, times zero, and size 12 font. The greatest sports team ever. Greatest sports team ever? Who's your, who are you gonna make the argument for? I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna do some research and find out later. True scientific method, great. People like the sports ones here. Anybody got other ideas? Yes. Greatest author? Do you got a home pick? No, you're just gonna like think about it, maybe come up with one later. 
All right, so one of the things you're gonna have to do to do this, and like you can take notes about this, I put the definitions on here so you don't have to write them down. You notice they're in italics next to them, so maybe like later you can remember. Um, so I've done half your note taking for you. The definitions might not be exactly what's on this screen because I typed these from my brain and went like, yeah, this is close enough. Whatever, prep work is a little sloppy. Too excited to just uh, get here and yell at you guys. But as we do this, I want you to think about uh, kind of how this uh, is gonna work with your own example. So uh, the first thing you're gonna have to do is evaluate some evidence, because uh, don't be uh, like my father-in-law who just goes on Facebook talking nonsense all day about like absolute bullshit evidence. Never has evidence, he just has opinions. <laughs> Sucks. That's why I unfollowed him. Don't tell him. Definition, determining what sources are most accurate and applicable. You wanna bring in good evidence and pulling in quality sources from people with expertise will give you a better idea. I know a lot about basketball. If we're talking about, uh, let's say, last year's Waldorf basketball season, I got some opinions. I was there. I went to many of the games. I watched many of the live streams. I follow basketball closely. I have an okay basketball resume. <sighs> Whose opinion are you taking? Mine or Jenks? Jenks, probably, yeah. He's got the expertise, right? That's his job. It's a thing I like to follow. I don't wanna support you guys, but that's how I like to think about expertise and evaluating evidence. Because you build your own credibility by what you're appealing to with outside sources. You wanna talk about the Dakota people in Iowa? If you're gonna to talk to a white person about it, I'm probably the guy. Go talk to the Dakota about it, and then I'll be like, 487 on the list of people you probably want to talk to about that. Think about that when you're pulling stuff into these arguments, though. And I put in some of these factors. These are going to be more useful to us in a historical context, but they can help you make your greatest argument as well. Like if we're talking about uh, the greatest uh, uh, NBA basketball player of all time, we're talking about political factors, you can talk about like LeBron has had a huge influence on social justice that I think adds to his credibility as a person and the weight and gravity of him as a like entity. Michael Jordan once said, like, Republicans buy sneakers too. But would and, that be an off-court thing though? Sure. And I don't know if we're framing it that way. I mean, are we drafting our team? You know, like taking like if I just gotta get five people to show up and play ball. Anyway, you can determine some of those parameters about the argument you're making. That's one of the things about arguments. And I want you to understand about history as we work through the semester. People frame arguments in all sorts of different ways. That's why people make some real bullshit arguments sometimes. Maybe some of you are gonna make them on Tuesday. I'll make some of the others of you really mad. But that's why we wanna learn about how to do this better. Economics, right? Who's made the most money is usually an all right uh, indicator of things. Michael Jordan's still making money. If you were doing your author example, who's the greatest author of all time, you go out and you go like, well, is Nicholas Sparks the greatest author of all time because he sells more books? My mother-in-law buys every single one. It's what I get her for Christmas every year. Nicholas Sparks puts a book out. I buy it, give it to Sandy. She's happy. She puts it on a shelf, doesn't read it, but it's there. <laughs> She's happy that I got it. She says, thank you. <sighs> Economic factors can come into this. These are pretty straightforward. Social and cultural factors are important too. Uh, the idea of how people organize their relationships in groups, especially if you were like talking about uh, greatest comedic actor of all time, I would argue that Dave Chappelle has a much greater social cultural impact than Adam Sandler. Maybe not, he might be a tough hill to die on, but I could do that. And like social factors are how people organize their relationships and groups. Cultural factors establish beliefs, values, traditions, laws, and languages, and how we're changing those things or keeping them consistent, all things uh, to consider. Just things you might wanna think about as you're considering different evidence. This also creates biases, right? People we know in arguments have political bias. Probably, you know, if you read a pamphlet about gun control from the Democratic Party, it probably looks different than the one that comes out from the Republican Party. Fair? Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't know. As an independent, they both want my vote. I just wanna have a tank, though. <laughs> Mm, it doesn't have an engine. That Sherman tank, they pulled it out, filled the engine compartment with concrete. The cannon on the other side doesn't work either. 
That's one of my favorite. We'll talk about all of these things later. Like uh, you'll find out like last election, I voted for eight uh, uh, Democrats and seven Republicans for all sorts of different things. Cause I like try to like figure out what's important to the people that are running for office. Like what are the two things they're probably gonna work on? Like, cause that's kind of how we work in life, right? Yeah, you focus. Here's what I'm trying to get done. And then I vote for them based on that and how that aligns with what I actually think about things. It takes a lot of work to figure it out. That's part of being a person. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. With gun control though, that's always where I go. Like, can I get a stealth bomber? Right to bear arms, second amendment. It's there to protect us from the government. The government has nuclear missiles. <laughs> Bring that M16, see how fast you die. <sighs> I, yeah, and, I mean, I'll, full disclosure, I own many guns, but uh, and enjoy shooting them when ammo's not in such shortage. But, that's not here nor there. So why do we evaluate evidence? Because otherwise, like, people will manipulate it and show us uh, parts of things to make us misunderstand situations. There are other things, like the picture in the middle, where your perspective changes versus how you're looking at things. Um, and also because sometimes, uh, if you evaluate the wrong evidence, People will uh, just show you things that'll make thing, the situation look entirely different than it actually is. I mean, that's a realistic thing, right? In the far side, the guy looks like he's trying to provide somebody with help, and in reality, you can just get him out of the situation. Those are important things, I think, with evaluating evidence that we need to uh, consider as we're working our way through. At the top, it says historical significance. This is how most people make arguments. This is what I call the big why. Um, and uh, because there's some how, who, what, where, why, when questions that go into this, the idea of like how events are relevant, important to modern scholars, you could also phrase it, as I believe I did on the paper, why events are relevant, important to modern scholars. Why do we care today? In our broader class, after we get out of this greatest debate next week, we're gonna talk about a lot of different stuff, but tons of things have happened in the history of the United States since 1877. So why are we spending our time talking about this in a class where we could talk about almost anything else? Why are we still talking about these big things and how do they shape the world we live in today is one of the things you want to think about with historical significance. This would be an important one in your author one. It's an important one in any argument you're gonna make, but why, do, how does it resonate? I'd be really interested to like get the English faculty in a room and just throw that grenade in there. Watch them fight it out based on their expertise. They're all too nice though. Mm -hmm. Trying to think who would win. Dr. Milan boxes, so if it turned physical, oh, he's yeah, the smart I bit. I think it'd be Dr. Milan. No question that the rest of them are too nice. As you guys are making this, I think we get this. This seems really easy on the surface, but we're gonna learn this semester that like you have to look at the other stuff and be able to take a step back and see the big picture to truly understand historical significance. Because if you can't see the big picture, you gotta understand all the little things in the picture to see the big picture. And that's gonna be one of the things that our other skills will help us with as well. But uh, we'll keep this in mind. This will be part of it. This is always a good, like one of the things you could do on this, you notice there's six of these and you gotta write two pages. If you wrote three paragraphs on each page and one of them was about each of these things, it'd be really easy to write this paper, right? Pretty straightforward. Agency contingency is a big deal. Uh, the idea of the ability of a single individual or group to shape outcomes of historical events. This is uh, one of the ways I think about this is if somebody else was there, would things turn out differently? How are the 1998 Chicago Bulls different if you substituted LeBron James for Michael Jordan? I don't know, I still think they beat the Jazz because Stockton won, we're sorry, but <sighs> who knows? This is where, like, uh, what does American comedy look like without Adam Sandler? I don't know. What were you going to say? Hmm, Drew Bledsoe. Yeah, what if that doesn't happen? I'm sure Tom Brady still rises to the top, maybe. Yeah. But that's what gives Tom Brady maybe historical agency, right? The idea that he's a person, the situation changes based on, like, how bad are the Green Bay Packers gonna be when Aaron Rodgers gives up on the season? This is very heavy on my mind right now. He 
because the Packers have had a good quarterback my whole life. And we're about to suck for a long time. Oh, oh yeah, we'll be great. Utah State, baby. <sighs> we're going to see this in historical situations play out differently as we look at people like Martin Luther King Jr., or Malcolm X, or... Uh, I don't know, because they definitely led different mo movements in different ways, or even like Russell Means of the American Indian Movement, or we look at generals in World War II, or we look at uh, iconic uh, kind of uh, charismatic dictator type people like Adolf Hitler or uh, Tojo in Japan. All of these different people have some kind of gravitas and they make a difference being that individual. And if it was somebody else, it might not work out the same way. Some of you might understand this because a lot of you raised your hands earlier and you said you play sports. Anybody play for a dog shit coach? Yeah, everybody has that experience sooner or later. You're around somebody else, and then it's like Waldorf football. When I got here, we had lost every game but one every year. We'd beat Trinity Bible by 100 and lose to everybody else by 55. <laughs> you just felt so bad for those Trinity Bible kids. They had like 22 kids on the team total. And they just, and you'd be like, I know we're bad, so like, what's happening here? And then our own charismatic leader arrived, Josh Littrell, turned this motherfucker around. Um, yeah, that's my guy. I guess I haven't talked to him. Tom will tell you. No, I've talked to him still. Tom. Pretty frequently. But he made a difference. Uh, everything changed in that dynamic here. Um, this is one of the things that you can see people matter. That's the point that hey, agency and contingency really gets at. People make decisions in historical moments. Maybe you can understand this better in your own life. The idea that like anybody ever made a bad decision. I make bad decisions every day. You ever suffer the consequences of those decisions later? You ever make a good decision and then good things happen? It'll happen someday. We understand this because we all make choices day in, day out that shape the things that happen to us going forward. And so as we do this, we show our own agency and contingency as we work our way through different situations. So maybe that's a way to think about this. Um, there are several issues with this, right? Um, the idea that like uh, sometimes we get caught into what we call great uh, man theory this idea, and I'm sorry uh, for the genderization of great man theory, that's what people call it, um, that have written about it. I'm sure it's about to change with some article it's about to come out. But the idea that sometimes we build up these people to be more than they were, because all human beings are flawed, right? I put Monday on the syllabus for Tuesday, Thursday class. Got to get it together. The idea that we all make mistakes, nobody's perfect, and sometimes, especially historical people, we like to just look at them as like these monolithic entities that could do no wrong. And we're going to look at people like that this semester. People like, I love Martin Luther King Jr., so umbrella of mercy, but like there were things about MLK that weren't great at different times in his life. There are decisions he could have made differently. And if we try to like look at people as they're perfect in the same way, if you do that in your own life, it's going to ruin you because people let you down. Human beings are fallible. We all fall short sometimes. We all make poor decisions. We all do things that maybe later on we wish we didn't do. And like if we put historical people on this ped pedestal, we're not doing them any service either. This is one of the things people have a problem with with history. Like you see people debating this on Fox News all summer. Like the idea that like if we're just talking about things like they didn't really happen in the way that they did by going like, well, we're just gonna tell this triumphant story. We can all tell really good stories. Right? I can tell you a story of my life that I'm the hero and like I never did anything bad. That's a shitty story and you wouldn't believe me. Like, own it. And we gotta do that with people too. Uh, memory heroes are a real thing. When I was a kid, uh, I would have argued with you that Albert Bell was the greatest baseball player of all time. Anybody even know who Albert Bell was, is? Played for the Cleveland Indians. I one time wrote him a letter and he wrote me back. He was also kind of chubby and so was I. So he's my favorite dude. We have people in our minds, people do this with musicians a lot. You guys know who Connor Oberst is? Probably not. I would make an argument that he's the greatest musician of all time. He started a band called Bright Eyes when he was 14 years old in Saddle Creek Records out of Omaha, Nebraska, and he completely changed American folk music. I think he's the Bob Dylan of the current, not the current generation, my generation. I'm getting old, I'm not current anymore. But, I just built them up in my head, right? We do this with people. I don't know. It's a thing we'll, we want to think about too. Uh, we also have like in history in particular, we just write people out of history traditionally, right? 
We need to understand complexity and see all the different people that are present in different situations. We're going to see this a lot in this class where people are going to undercut people, particularly in the black community. Also, women are going to be incredibly marginalized in some of the things we're talking about. We're going to try to understand these things better by making sure we're not minimizing different populations, but sometimes narratives are created that write out specific people for specific reasons. Have you ever heard anybody say, history is told by the victors? Because powerful people usually create history. And guess what? They usually try to make themselves look all right. And so as we talk about some of the stuff, we confront ugly stuff. We're going to confront it in a way that doesn't minimize populations. Also, don't do this here. Villainization. People love to villainize uh, different things. Anybody think of a bad guy? Tony Montana. We understand how villainization works, right? Was the Joker that bad of a guy? Depends on which movie or cartoon you're watching. Maybe that's a way we can understand that nuance, but we'll talk about this stuff more. I'm gonna really have to cook for six minutes here if you're gonna do well on this. Continuity and change. How institutions, ideas, and problems evolve over time. What does it say on your sheet? Anybody wanna read it to me? Objective things that are different or the same over the course or of historical situations. See, I think that's a better definition. We know what objectivity is, the facts as they are. Anybody would have to agree. Whether you're my father-in-law flying like nine Trump flags on the flagpole on your farm, or you're any like someone else, I don't know. Donnie's not president. Just physically, he's not. Joe Biden's at the White House. You go look him up. The idea that when we look at continuities and changes, how I want us to do this in this class is to just go like, here is what we can determine to be true. What would anybody have to agree to in this situation? Because I can tell you like one, a not objective statement would be the uh, American government deciding to wipe out the bison on the Great Plains, destroyed native cultures throughout the United States. And you could disagree with that. You couldn't disagree that like the population of bison on the Great Plains from when like 60 million to like 147 over the course of like 30 years. Does that make sense? Those are things that we'd have to uh, look at. This is where it gets a little bit tricky though. You guys were talking about eras earlier, right? Bill Russell played at a different time. They didn't even keep track of blocked shots, although he blocked many shots. And, like Will Chamberlain scored 100 points in a game. Sometimes we want to look at numbers and just assume that means objectivity, but we got to understand some nuance to get this. So what I want you to try to do with this, and we'll get better at it over the course of the semester, is work on finding these objective things that are different or stay the same with whatever you're talking about. Does that make sense? I don't know how you, uh, like, like Saturday Night Live was different after Adam Sandler was there, because then they wanted to start to have somebody with musical talent on there. They could like make funny songs because Adam Sandler kind of changed how Saturday Night Live worked. Um, because what we're going to do is then take this and roll it into progress and decline, where we're going to look at positive and negative outcomes of these continuities and changes. So if you do a good job finding continuities and changes, you can then talk about how different people felt about them, right? So if we're making like the Lakers won the NBA bubble title. Is that true? I don't care how you feel about it, but that happened. I watched it on the television. I think it happened. Maybe it's all fixed, like pro wrestling in the 90s. LeBron won that title, and I think that changed how people think about LeBron James. Because he keeps getting the resume deeper. The guy's played 18,000 minutes. That's insane. Only three other people have done that, let alone done it at the level he's doing it at. That's an important piece of a LeBron James argument. Longevity. Jordan, really good. And maybe if you got like, you're gonna play one half of basketball, you need to win at the end of the game, you want MJ, you're building a franchise long term, maybe you want LeBron. I don't know. He'd probably leave anyway and go somewhere else for another team. <sighs> but when we look at progress and decline, one of the things we wanna look at is if you were like a hard Jordan person, uh, you might have viewed LeBron winning the title in the bubble as a decline. If you're a pro LeBron person, that's definitely progress. One of the traps here is people think about progress, like, because we talk about this as a society, we'll be like, look at all this progress. 
I want to ask you if you think like uh, when Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery bus boycott worked and they had to desegregate in uh, Alabama, if you think that everybody looked at that as progress. Because I promise you those dudes wearing white hoods didn't. Think about that in any situation. Maybe an easier way to think about this is like, there are always going to be haters. You never have to look that far to find them. You ever done anything good in your life and then people just immediately want to diminish it? Yeah, anytime you do anything good, you'll meet those people. Whatever, fuck them. But the idea that like, think about this when you think about progress and decline, there's always gonna be people that are like, that sucks. It's very rare. I don't think we could go through the whole room and maybe find something that we'd all go like, that's great. I mean, some of us maybe have enough like things in common that maybe it would work that way. Does that make sense? How we're gonna talk about this in relationship to continuity and change? So if we can find those objective things, then we can look at it and go like, well, here's who, how some people might have felt about it, here's how other people felt about it. And this brings nuance and complexity to our conversations so that's really important. Because we wanna understand the truth with a capital T, that rhymes with P and that stands for, uh, you're from Manly, not Mason City, LA, you went to school there. You probably still know the Music Man. I love the Music Man. I've been waiting for the Mason City Community Theater to put on a production. I've never been in a play in my life, but man, I can play Harold Hill. That's a children's theater. I'm way over the age limit. And this sets us up for uh, our last skill we're going to talk about quickly here, and I got one minute. So, Empathy and Moral Judgment. Anybody know what movie this is from? It's an old timey one. Hey, you went to high school. Anybody read the book? My student teacher, Mrs. Re Miss Reefer, her name's Mrs. Brand now, she had to teach ninth graders to kill a mockingbird, and that was my favorite book in the whole world at the time. You guys might figure out I was pretty outspoken, like, like to read. I messed her up for weeks. But why I put this picture up here is in that book, Harper Lee, through the character Atticus Finch, talks about, to paraphrase, sometimes you just gotta get in somebody else's skin and walk around for a little while. Anybody super judgmental? You don't have to own it. You can just think about it in your head. I tend to be judgmental sometimes. I think that's part of being a human being. What I want us to do, we're gonna have to pass judgments this class because you still gotta understand what's right and wrong. You can't just be like, mm, ain't the dude who showed up in Spirit Lake and killed all the white people there. Good for him. I mean, from his viewpoint, probably. Just watch his grandchild starve to death. Tough. You know, watch his whole way of life fall apart around him. We're gonna talk about that like at some point because that's like what I've been working on. But the idea that like if we try to understand, I want you to try to show empathy first before we pass judgment. Try to understand why people do the things that they do, why they maybe made the decisions they made. And I'm not like, we're not gonna go, Hitler was a good person. We're gonna go like, Hitler really cared about Germany and wanted to bring it back to success. Now the way he went about it, Pretty fucked up. But try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. That's just a good skill, period. So we're gonna do these kind of things. This can help you build your essay for Tuesday, and it'll help you start practicing these skills in a way that will benefit you for the rest of the course. That makes sense? All right, I appreciate you uh, sitting through the uh, rambling today. You guys are gonna have a bigger role in this as we get rolling on Tuesday. But I'll see you here with that work completed. Um, show up to your meetings. If you got questions, we'll talk about them then. But uh, or I'll stick around here for a minute. We can figure it out. Appreciate you guys. Uh, have a great weekend. Care about each other. Uh, watch football beat Briarcliff if you get a chance. Two pages. Two pages. I mean, you could write as much as you want. Make it at least two pages. Double space. Times your Roman standard thing. All that's on Blackboard, and I'll post uh, some information about it too. Oh sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, sure. Build that expertise. Sure. Appeal to those broader sources. Sounds good. Is it handwritten or Type it, turn it on Blackboard. Okay. All right. So it's like a, Does it have to be in that doc? Uh, yeah, for just don't put it in pages. I'll just turn it in on Blackboard. That's my only. Is it like a link to like copy and paste? I'll show you right now.
I should have showed everybody, but I'll put it in another video. You can watch it up there. We don't have to all crowd around. Somebody will walk in and be like, we're all getting COVID. <laughs> I do have to get to a meeting at around 3. I just wanted to let you know, as far as sports things and travel, um, it might affect my Tuesday classes sometimes. Yeah, we'll make it work. Yep. Everybody at Waldorf's traveling. Yeah, I'll give you an email as far as uh, what I see. Sounds good. All right, so when you guys go and you look at this, you find our class. If once you get in your blackboard, right, it'll be over here. You won't have nearly as many history classes, so it should be easy to find history 202, US to 1877, from 1877, whatever. Then you go over where it says uh, assignments. And if you click on this, you can see it here. So like, here's where I had like, you should do one of these four things, but you guys can do whatever you want. I assume in this group, we're probably talking hoops. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But all you gotta do to turn it in is you go here, um, it tells you about it. Um, it has the stuff that like, um, double space times uh, new Roman size 12, whatever, whatever. So everything's basically in there, we just gotta read it. Yeah. yeah, and I'll post a video about it too in the announcements and set out as an email. And then if you go like uh, browse local files, because you saved it in whatever, Word, pages, um, you do it, and then you'll upload it there. Drop it in there and it'll submit. Cool. Yep. The four class Tuesday. So knock it out, and that's just to get us in the routine, right? Because we're gonna do this every 